um, my apologies for the slight uh, delay in the beginning. I was at a doctoral defense, so I had to rush here. Um, so in Is it? It just cut out for some reason. Oh, really? Uh, okay, this is. Yeah, Brian, are you getting anything? Okay. You getting it? Okay. All right. So, uh, uh, what I want to do is I want to just uh, wrap up my discussion by looking at the letter in some detail. Uh, we had started looking at it, and I had described the context to you, the circumstances under which he'd written the letter, the circumstances that had led uh, Gandhi to uh, take the decision that he would actually initiate something uh, around uh, salt. Uh, a decision that, as I had mentioned to you before, uh, created a great deal of bewilderment among his colleagues and certainly in um, the circles of the British uh, administration uh, in India. Right. So uh, uh, let, me, let me just continue with my analysis of the letter very briefly, um, and that will give me an occasion, as I said, to wrap up the discussion on Gandhi's uh, critique of colonialism. I want to also remind you uh, that this is a critique that he had initiated uh, when he had actually been put on trial in 1922, because recall that in that trial in 1922, uh, Gandhi had set out uh, in, uh, to describe how he had transitioned from being a loyalist, a loyalist meaning someone who in fact believed at that point in time uh, that Indians might be able to acquire rights uh, as equal citizens within the British Empire, that he had transitioned from that position to a position where he had become what he calls a staunch non-cooperator, right? Uh, 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 in other words, a uh, position he was articulating now uh, that, uh, that circumstances in 1922, by 1920, had become such that it was no longer possible for him to believe that Indians would actually acquire rights, equal rights as citizens within the empire. Uh, and then gradually then over the course of the decade, what, what really happens is that the demand for, uh, for self-determination, for complete independence becomes overwhelming. Uh, and this is the juncture at which then Gandhi launches that, uh, the salt satyagraha. Uh, now this letter uh, is really one of the most unusual documents in the annals of world revolution for reasons that I've already indicated to you and I just wanted to recapitulate that before I get back into the letter again because because if you think about the circumstances I mean it's highly unusual for uh, a revolutionary here to address uh, somebody uh, such as a viceroy and tell him that well look this is what I, exactly what I propose to do uh, you are in fact actually free uh, to come and arrest me, to stop me if you want, uh, right? So he lays bare his, his uh, strategy and he lays bare his soul, essentially. That's what he's doing in this letter that he writes to Lord Irvin in 1930. And why do I regard the British rule as a curse, he says? It has impoverished a dumb millions by a system of progressive exploitation and by a ruinously expensive military and civil administration which the country can never afford. Right, that what British rule has bequeathed to us is an administration uh, which is an administration intended for the benefit of the oppressors, uh, something that has in fact actually impoverished the dumb millions, meaning the masses, the Indian masses. And when he says dumb here, he doesn't mean dumb in the, in the American sense of how people understand dumb, stupid. What he means are people who are who don't have a voice, who are voiceless. That's what he means when he says dumb over here. Dumb millions by a system of progressive exploitation and by a ruinously expensive military and civil administration which the country can never afford. Now, let me give you an illustration which is really quite an extraordinary illustration that he gives in the letter. The inequities, he says, are maintained in order to carry on a foreign administration demonstrably the most expensive in the world. Take your own salary, he writes to the viceroy. It is over rupees 21,000 per month, besides many other indirect additions. The British Prime Minister gets 5,000 pounds per year, over rupees 4,500 per month at the present rate of exchange. You are getting over rupees 700 per day against India's average income of less than Anna's two per day. 
less than two annas per day. So it's 16 annas that make up one rupee. So what is he doing here? He's saying that if you look at what the British Prime Minister gets, okay, and what the Viceroy gets, that is a ruler of India, and what the average person in India gets, he's given you three salaries, and then he'll give you some ratios. The Prime Minister gets rupees 180, that is the British Prime Minister, per day against Great Britain's average income of nearly rupees per day. So the British Prime Minister gets 90 times more than what an average person in Britain gets, which is unjust enough. However, you, he says to the Viceroy, you get rupees 700 per day against India's average income of less than annas two per day. So if you translate the annas into rupee, he's saying the ratio there is one to 5,600. One to 5,600. You get 5,106 times more than the average Indian. But in Britain, the Prime Minister gets 90 times more only, comparatively. Right? So this is what he's referring to here. I mean, and, and we want to see, however, how he ends this particular paragraph. Thus, you are getting much over 5,000 times India's average income. The British Prime Minister is getting only 90 times Britain's average income. On bended knee, I ask you to ponder over this phenomenon. Forgive me for trespassing into your private life. On bended knee. Right? So here's this, all right, look, I have the command over all the details, and yet I'm humbly informing you reflect on what is happening in the country, right? I have taken a personal illustration to drive home a painful truth. I have too great a regard for you as a man to wish to hurt your feelings. Right? I don't mean to, you know, I don't mean to really impugn you. You are getting the salary as a viceroy. This is a systemic problem in the administration of India. And now here, there are wonderful punchlines here. I know that you do not need the salary you get. Probably the whole of your salary goes for charity, right? <laughs> okay. I mean, a wonderful sense of humor. He says, yeah, you know, look, I mean, I know you're a very kind and virtuous man. You're a good Christian. You probably send all your salary over to charity. You don't really need it, right? But this is a systemic problem, right? So he's softening the blow, right? But a system that provides for such an arrangement deserves to be summarily scrapped. What is true of the vice-regal salary is true generally of the whole administration. Right? That what is true of you is true of every British civil servant in the country. That all of these people are living on the misery of ordinary Indians. They are fattening themselves on the wealth of the country. And probably all of them give their salaries to charity, right? So forth and so on. Right? So, you know, one of the extraordinary things about Gandhi too here is his absolute command over the rhetorical strategies. I mean, here's a person who's obviously crafted this whole idea of the salt satyagra. He thinks of the symbol. I mean, think of how a person is deploying a symbol to now wage a national struggle and it is complemented by the fact that he is absolutely in command of the English language here and the rhetorical strategies that one might deploy. Because part of what, of course, Gandhi is always doing is that, he's, that, that these rhetorical strategies are just as important. The command over the English language, you know, the particular way in which he is always negotiating with a person, but trying to, it's not appeasement. It's saying that, look, I'm going to take the most generous view of a person that I can. I'm going to take the most generous view of you. Right? I realize that these are the shortcomings that are systemic. These are not necessarily your own shortcomings, you know, so forth and so on. Right? So when we, when we now look at, and you know, we don't really have the luxury of being, being able to go over, but, uh, of the, over the entire document, but when you read this, you know, you have to chuckle to yourself as well. You see, it's a very serious document. It's an extraordinary indictment of British rule. It's an unusual letter document in the annals of world revolution, a letter written of this kind, right? And yet, it is something that is very humane. It has a sense of humor. 
And as I said, it basically exemplifies the command that Gandhi was able to muster over the English language. Now, so what is the totality of the critique of colonialism? The totality of the critique of colonialism is that this is a system that has been highly exploitative for Indians. It has not benefited those whom it was supposed to benefit because ultimately, of course, you have to ask yourselves, you know, what, is, what, what was the justification used by the British? to govern India. And there are a number of justifications. One of the justifications, for example, was this idea that India was an oriental despotism, that you know, India did not have a democratic system, right? Uh, and that what the British do is they bring a regime of law and order. And then, what, of course, what we saw in, in, the, in the speech that he, he made when he was put on trial in 1922, he essentially takes that argument apart, right? Then, of course, he, he has this argument that what colonialism does is it alienates the British from themselves. That colonialism brings out the worst in people, not just in those who are oppressed because it makes them into slaves, it brings out the worst in the oppressor. In the oppressor. Right? And so ultimately, I want to suggest to you, and we're going to be, we have been talking about this throughout this class, but we're going to move towards a more more nuanced uh, adumbration of this particular thesis that when Gandhi is really speaking about colonialism, he's not simply speaking about colonialism in the ordinary sense of the term, about a system of military, economic, cultural exploitation. He's speaking about the colonization of the mind. Right? What are the ways in which people fundamentally get colonized? And they can get colonized under any political system. Right? under any political system, and a democracy as well, but obviously in, in a system where things are vastly unequal between the rulers and the ruled, then this question of colonization becomes even more profound. And in the last two weeks of this course in particular, we are going to move to, as I said, a greater adumbration of these issues. Does anybody have any questions? Because essentially what we are doing now is we are wrapping up um, that segment of the course where we had started out, I mean, I just want to recapitulate just so that you can think about the overall scheme of this, of where we are now and the overall scheme of the course thus far, is that we obviously began with a consideration of the whole question of nonviolence and truth, what Gandhi means by these categories, uh, gave you the intellectual and cultural background to Gandhi's own life, uh, to 19th century Gujarat and to 19th century British India moving into the early 20th century, the development of Indian nationalism, uh, Gandhi's time in South Africa, his return to India, and then his assumption of the leadership of this movement, uh, and then of course his critiques of modernity and colonialism, right? This is, this is where we have come thus far. So does anybody have any questions about what I mentioned about colonialism? Because I want to then move on now to the next segment, uh, if anybody doesn't have any queries. Yes? Was the salaries of the Viceroy and the other British officers, was that public information? Oh yes, it's public information, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they, uh, it, it, that kind of accountability was there. This is something that, that Gandhi would have been able to extract uh, without any difficulty at all. Yeah, information of that kind, yes. All right, what I want to do um, today, is I want to look at Gandhi's relations with women. But in particular, what I'm interested in. So we've had Gandhi's critique of modernity. We've had Gandhi's critique of colonialism. And today, what I'm particularly interested in, but in order to lead to that, I have to look at Gandhi's relations with women very briefly. I'm interested in Gandhi's critique of masculinity in particular. Right? And when we move to the last segment, we're going to look at Gandhi's critique of the nation state and the world system, if I may put it this way, right? So you can, if you have to think of four major axes of critiques, so that what we're doing today is we're looking at the third major axis of that critique that Gandhi has. But before we can do that, it would be, I think, instructive to understand what his relations are with women. Now, it's important to mention that because in the traditional Indian model, if I may if I may put it this way, uh, not that there is one traditional Indian model, but uh, and it's not necessarily the case that it's only, it's only Indian. Uh, in general, P 
people with a saintly reputation, deservedly or otherwise, right? People with a saintly reputation, people who have gravitated towards a life of asceticism. In general, the assumption has always been that you should keep away from the temptations of the flesh. Right? That one way in which you become, so for example, if you look at monastic orders, in monastic orders, uh, we know that uh, traditionally men were not even permitted to marry. I mean, and, and the vow of celibacy was, was critical to most monastic orders, if not all of them. And that, that has obviously changed because notions of priesthood have changed. And one of the reasons why, of course, all of these news items that we constantly encounter every day about, you know, uh, Catholic priests molesting young boys, so forth and so on, why that becomes so ma a matter of such deep agitation is precisely because there's been long an expectation that those people who call themselves men or women of religion, in particular those who have joined monastic orders, who have taken vows of celibacy, that they above all should steer clear of such things. And more widely, they should steer clear of the company of women. Why get tempted at all? Right? And I think the first thing I want to alert you to is the fact that Gandhi, Gandhi absolutely loved the company of women. He adored their company. This is not your typical Indian saint who says, well, I've taken a vow and now I'm going to go sit on a 20,000 feet peak for the rest of my life. No, he is constantly surrounded by women. They might be his devotees, they might be his disciples, they might be women who are eager to get his views on women, on sexuality, on femininity, on any number of subjects. He is constantly surrounded by women. I mean, one of the most endearing photographs of Gandhi that you're going to see, and you are, we're going to have a session, if you look at the syllabus, you'll notice that I've put aside one, one session where I'm going to give you basically a running slideshow uh, of images of Gandhi and going to try to create a narrative from those. Um, but, but one of those endearing images is these two young grandnieces he has, mentioned at the bottom of this slide, Manu and Abba, uh, who were known as his walking sticks, as they were called, towards the end of his life, that they were constantly uh, accompanying him. Um, right. So uh, 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 I'm suggesting to you that th this is the first instructive thing that we have to think about, that here's this man who's taken a vow of celibacy in his mid-30s. And it is certainly very clear, by the way, uh, that Gandhi never had any sexual relations as such with any woman, including his wife, after he took the vow of celibacy. All right, but if you've read my article, you know that we're going to have to get into some complexities, the article that was assigned to you for this particular week, uh, for this particular segment. Uh, but we'll get to that towards the end. So let me begin with, with Kasturba, his wife. Uh, Kasturba was actually a year older than Gandhi. Uh, he was 13 years old, uh, and she was 14 when they got married. Uh, this is important. The age is important here because this is an illustration of uh, the evil that Gandhi speaks about in some of these articles, in some of the pieces that were assigned to you. Uh, and that is the evil of child marriage. Uh, and one of the debates that they had in India, in colonial India, was what was called the age of consent controversy. So the age of consent controversy was uh, when an attempt was made by the British government of India at the behest of Indian social reformers. They're the ones who were initiating the government to undertake this, this change. Uh, and the change was that the government wanted to say that there's going to be a minimum age for marriage, that a girl cannot give her consent to her marriage until she's at least 17 years old, and a boy has to be at least 18 years old. Right? Okay, that's the general, you know, there, there were variations, and, but this is what is called the age of consent controversy, because typically, in many Indian families, it was quite common for a girl to be married before she had even achieved puberty. Before she had even achieved puberty, she would get married. Uh, if she was married before she had achieved puberty, then what would happen in those cases is that she would continue to stay in her natal home, in her, in her parents' home, and she would only move to her husband's home when she had achieved puberty and was therefore capable of consummation of the marriage. Right? But, if she, but if she was actually um, married, and, and there are cases, by the way, and in some parts of India, in some villages, 
this is true down to the present day. There are, there are children who are actually, the parents agree to a marriage when the children are two, three, four, five years old, right? Of course, that doesn't mean that the girl goes and stays with the boy's family when she's three or four years old. And that's why I'm, that's why I'm giving you what, uh, what the arrangement would typically be. And of course, this is not typical today for, let's say, urban middle class families at all, not even remotely, right? Uh, nonetheless, this is the context in which Gandhi and Kasturba get married. Um, uh, the marriage takes place in 1883, uh, and they are faithfully married to each other, at least as far as we know, until her death in 1944. This is uh, uh, three and a half years before Gandhi himself was assassinated. So she did not live to see um, the birth of independent India, because that was August 15th, 1947. Now, uh, uh, the autobiography himself actually tells you a great deal about the relationship between Gandhi and Kasturba, uh, sim sometimes known affectionately simply as Ba uh, Kastur. Recently, there have been biographies of Kasturba, because I think the traditional biographers of Gandhi uh, more or less assume that she was really, uh, you know, she was important but incidental at the same time. In other words, that, you know, well, she's his companion, she's his wife, she's his helpmate, soulmate, so forth and so on, but that one didn't really need to expend too many pages on her. Uh, I think that that view has now undergone a, a fairly radical shift because I think that there is a keener understanding uh, of the fact that Kasturba had a mind of her own, uh, and, and in fact, actually, very often in Gandhi's absence, because Gandhi spent quite a few years in jail, various prison terms, for example, uh, that in Gandhi's absence, that she... Um, in a sense, maintained the fort, so to speak. All right. So there's a much greater awareness of her place, uh, uh, both uh, as Gandhi's wife and what that really implied, uh, and as somebody who was an independent figure in her own right, and perhaps even in some ways an important player in the independence movement. Uh, now, uh, there have been allegations, uh, uh, and I have to tell you one thing straight off, that all of the criticisms that you usually encounter from Gandhi, uh, uh, of Gandhi, they all stem from Gandhi's own writings. That if, for example, he brutalized her, okay, let, let's say hypothetically, how would you know that? You would know that from Gandhi's own autobiography. Right? If Gandhi, you know, used derogatory words for black people, how would you know that? It's not that he's disguising it, that you have to read some secret unpublished document. No, that everything is there either in the autobiography or in, of course, that huge corpus of works that has been generated by Gandhi himself. Right? Recall that the collected works of Gandhi run into 98 volumes uh, plus the two index volumes, and then there's material that we know that has not been accumulated in the collected works. So, for example, let me give you an illustration. Right? And I think that this illustration is instructive because it suggests the kind of attitude that he had towards Kasturba in the early years. And then he himself tells you in the autobiography that he then came to see that, well, actually, this is not really how you treat someone who is your wife and your companion or your life companion. Right? And what is that illustration? He says that when he was in the ashram, that there were visitors who would come. Okay, and Gandhi had this, how, this standing rule that there were no flush toilets here. There were, so, you know, there were chamber pots, okay? There were no flush toilets. And that the waste would have to be removed by everybody working in the ashram. Now, Kasturba came from a traditional conservative family. And the idea that you would do this kind of work was absolute anathema to her. I mean, it was unthinkable to her as it would have been unthinkable to most upper caste people. The idea that you would sweep the street if you were upper caste people, because this is something that is done by a lower caste person. All of this kind of work was considered to be absolutely unthinkable for a upper caste person such as Kasturba. Right? And so he tells you that in his autobiography that she refused to do it. And then he dragged her by her garments and said, I'm throwing you out of the house. I'm throwing you out of the house because anyone who lives with me in the ashram must follow the same rules. And you are no different than anyone else. And then she says, for Christ's sake, just take hold of your senses. 
I'm your wife. You know, is this how you treat your wife? And then he says he sort of cooled down. And then if you read the autobiography, he tells you that, well, later on he reflected about it and realized that this was obviously not the way to try to persuade a person, that there was violence in that particular act that he had undertaken. So what we're going to find is that in the early years, and I should say that the early years, again, we have a mixed record simply because they were separated for a good portion of the early years. Remember that he goes to London. When he goes to London, he's already been married for several years. Right? He goes to London and he goes by himself. He doesn't take Kasturba with him. So he spends a few years in London. He comes back to India for a year. Then he goes to South Africa. And initially when he went to South Africa, he was not accompanied by Kasturba. And by that time, he's already a father. Right? He's got four sons. So, you know, she, she is shouldering that particular burden. And this was also, by the way, going to be a point of contention between them much later on. Because Gandhi's oldest son... Uh, uh, is is uh, going to become a, a rebel, okay? He's going to become a rebel. Hari Lal is his name, uh, and uh, I think that this was a matter of great sorrow both to both to uh, Gandhi and to Kasturba. The fact that Hari Lal had completely drifted away from from at least his father, um, and I think that Kasturba might have wanted Gandhi to take a different view. When I say a different view of the matter, I'll give you a very simple illustration. Again, Gandhi himself tells you about it, right? So. Uh, Gandhi had spent, as you know, all these years in South Africa, uh, and Gandhi himself had been educated overseas. He'd been educated in England. Now, there was an opportunity when Hari Lal was a young man to go abroad on a scholarship. Gandhi refused to give his permission. And Hari Lal became furious. He became furious and he said, well, you went. Why are you stopping me from going? And then Gandhi's view of the matter there is, number one, I made a mistake. I don't want you to repeat that mistake. Okay? I think I was mistaken in my idea of what London would represent, what good it would do to me. Now, we can retrospectively take a different view and say that Gandhi might have actually been made in London for all we know. Right? That would be one way to... But Gandhi's view of the matter here was... Also, there were other in things which are intrinsic to his refusal to give permission to Hari Lal to travel. And one of them was that there was no reason for Gandhi to favor his son over all the other possible applicants for this scholarship. And that if Hari Lal was under the expectation that his father, who was already by this time the Mahatma, so to speak, that if his father was going to favor him, then he was deeply mistaken in understanding his own father. And this is something that I touched upon in very early on when I, when I suggested that this idea that, you know, one is going to be partial to one's own wife or sons or siblings or other close relatives, this is something that Gandhi could not tolerate at all. So there's going to be a difference of opinion, not just between Hari Lal and Gandhi on this, but Kasturba is going to come in between because she's going to try to plead with Gandhi, suggesting that, well, perhaps you should you know, be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about your own son. Uh, and why is it? I think that there is this taunt which, which Kasturba places before Gandhi, but many others did as well, that you might be the father of the nation, so to speak. Now, he's not officially the father of the nation at this point in time. That's going to happen after his assassination. Or that there are millions of people looking up to you, but how come your own son is not looking up to you? But I think that that is a very common problem. This is not a problem that is in, even remotely incidental to Gandhi. Right? The fact that very successful people, for example, their own children drift away completely from them, so forth and so on. And so you can put it into that generic category, but here I'm giving you the particulars because I'm trying to suggest to you that there were these obviously troubled moments as well. But what is really extraordinary, I think, is the long years of companionship. And one of the most touching photographs, which I'm going to show to you later on when we have that slideshow, is when Kasturba passes away. Okay? And they, they are actually, at this point, they're confined to what is called the Aga Khan's palace. It had been turned into a jail. But this is where, this was Gandhi and Kasturba had been confined between 1942 and 1944 after the launch of what is called the Quit India Movement. And in this photograph, you see, you know, Kasturba's, she's, she's passed away, her body is uh, there on the floor, uh, and Gandhi's sitting in the corner, 
and you can see the pensiveness and sorrow on his face. It, it just comes across very clearly. Right? So this is a life uh, that was uh, a, a relationship that lasted, as I said, for um, over 60 years. All right. And let's try to complicate some element of it by bringing in Mirabhan. Okay. So who is Mirabhan? Uh, and, and we're looking at these relationships just to give you a sense of the kind of women who are around Gandhi. All right? So Meera Ben is a woman. Her birth name is Madeline Slade. She comes from an extremely aristocratic English family. All right? Her father was one of the highest placed officers in the British Navy. He was an admiral of the British fleet, her father. Now, to cut a very long story short, she has a book which is extraordinarily readable and, and, uh, and uh, a curious kind of work. It's called The Spirit's Pilgrimage. Right? So what I'm going to narrate to you now comes from her own account of how she met Gandhi and how she became interested in Gandhi. So Madeline Slade, when she was growing up, was deeply in love with Beethoven with Beethoven's music. And she wrote a letter to a man called Romain Roland, who today is largely unknown except to those who are very serious readers. Uh, Romain Roland was a, a, literary, a gigantic literary figure of his times, actually. He won the Nobel Prize for Literature, by the way. Um, but he was also a biographer of Beethoven. So she writes a letter to Romain Roland saying that, you know, I'm a great admirer of Beethoven's music. I've read your biography and all of that, and I'd like to uh, come and see you. He was living in Switzerland, she's in England, uh, and you know, she used to take, like many, many aristocratic families, well-to-do families, you know, you would go to the Swiss Alps, for example, for a vacation, right? So anyhow, she meets Romain Rolla, uh, and uh, Romain Rolla, and uh, you know, they have a little conversation, and she says, uh, you know, I really wanted to meet you because Beethoven is my hero, right? Uh, and Romain Rolla says to you, if you want a hero, why are you going for a dead hero rather than a living hero? And she says, is there a living hero? And, and he says, yes, there's a small brown man in India, and his name is Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi. Now, she's never heard of him, right? She's never heard of him, and he alerts her to the fact that he had written a book, one of the earliest books written on Gandhi. It's, it's, it's by Romain Roland, the man who became one with the universal spirit. That's what the book is called, 1920. So he says to her, he gives her, presents her a copy of the book and says, well, I think you should get in touch with Mohandas Gandhi. So she reads his book, is absolutely blown away, and decides that she's going to dedicate her whole life to Gandhi. Right? So what does she do? She writes a letter to Gandhi and says, well, I'm so-and-so, I'm the daughter of an English admiral, I'd like to come and meet you, and I'd like to actually just come and stay with you in your ashram. And what does Gandhi do? He writes to her saying, you know, well, I'm greatly appreciative of your interest in my work and in my life, but are you aware of the extremely difficult circumstances under which we live in India? Are you aware of the fact that, for example, in the ashram there are no beds, you're going to sleep on the floor, it's a completely vegetarian diet, you're going to have to do hard labor, you're going to have to work in the kitchen, you're going to have to clean the toilets, all of us do that. Right? And you're going to have to learn spinning and weaving. And so what does Meera Ben do? She's called Madeline Slade at this point. She's not called Meera Ben. We'll see what the, trend, what the name change here means. So what does Madeline Slade do? She issues an order to all the servants in this palatial home that she lives that she wants her room stripped bare of all furniture. The furniture is removed. They are given instructions. She's going to have a vegetarian diet because one of the things that Gandhi had told her was, I'm not going to discourage you from coming, but if you want to come, I think you need to prepare yourself beforehand for one year. So for one year, she leads a life of asceticism in her palatial home, right? She strips away, as I said, the furniture, trans you know, takes up a vegetarian diet, does away with all her fancy dresses, all of that starts to learn how to spin. And one year later, she leaves for India, she goes to Ahmedabad, which is where Gandhi had his ashram, and the little episode 
way she describes her first meeting is priceless, absolutely. Okay, what does she say? She says that so she was received at the train station in Ahmedabad by some of Gandhi's lieutenants, some of the people who worked with him. They take her to the ashram and Gandhi is seated in the room and she says she was ushered into his presence and all she remembers is she saw a halo, a light. And then Gandhi placed his hand on her head and said, you shall be blessed. And he rechristens her Mirabhan. So Mirabhan is the name of a very famous female devotee, a bhakti poet, okay, by the name of Mirabhai. And so Mirabhan is after Mirabhan. And this is November 1925. And she is going to continue to stay in India well beyond Gandhi's assassination. There's a little coda to that story which doesn't really interest us so much for the present purposes, but eventually she's going to return to her first love, to Beethoven. She's going to live, in, live outside Vienna, which is where, of course, Beethoven had spent many years. Right? This is what she's going to do when she eventually returns to Europe in 1962, but she continued to live in India beyond the assassination. Now, they have what is undoubtedly a platonic relationship. And there's an interesting set of questions, but this is going to get us far afield from what we want to do because we'd have to start looking at some psychoanalytic literature. We're going to have to look at anecdotal literature, the biographies. Uh, what did Kasturba, for example, think about the relationship? Right? When I say a platonic relationship, uh, I mean precisely that, that there's no sexual relationship between the two at all. It was absolutely unthinkable. Uh, and she was not remotely interested, neither was he remotely interested. But it is a friendship of extreme affection. And there are times when Mira Ben writes to Gandhi and says, you know, for example, he goes on a tour, right? Or he goes to help out the, the peasants in a particular place. There's a campaign going on, right? The salt satyagra, for example, right? So she writes, you know, I am, you know, you have left me, you have abandoned me. I feel rudderless. I feel like a boat without a driver. Right? So the, the, she writes these letters of extreme longing, extreme longing. And it suggests, of course, the closeness of the relationship. And there are times, certainly, when it seems that Mirabhan is much closer to Gandhi than is Kasturba. But of course, now what you would have to consider, and here again I'll give you an illustration before I close this particular chapter, right? Um, you would have to consider the fact that unlike Kasturba, who was illiterate, by the way. Okay? She never had any education. That unlike Kasturba, Madeline Slade or Mira Ben was obviously an educated woman. And of course, in her early life, in the first few decades, she had had an aristocratic upbringing. She had had the benefit of education, which many girls did not have. Many English girls did not have. If you came from a, from a working class family, the likelihood that and you were a girl that you would get educated uh, was not very great, frankly. Right? And it is only, of course, moving into the middle part of the 20th century that we begin to find that education becomes really universal for girls as well. Right? So she had the benefit of all of that and Gandhi was aware of that. So when he goes to London, when does he go to London? He goes to London after the Salt Satyagra, right? Because he is because he is going to be invited by the British, and I had I had referred to this when I had mentioned to you that Churchill understood the real significance of what had happened in 1930, because for the first time the British said, "We are willing to negotiate with you for the future of India's independence." And whatever Gandhi came back with, whether he came back empty-handed or not, which is a criticism that has been made by some of those who are hostile to him, in particular that Gandhi, in fact, actually did not really negotiate the way that he should have. He allowed the British to have the upper hand, so forth and so on. The critical thing is he goes to London in 1931 for what is called the first round table conference. Who is he accompanied by? By Mira Ben. But here, again, there's a strategic thing. It's not simply that she is the female companion to Gandhi at this juncture. It's the fact that she can mediate between him and the British. She herself is a Britisher. And I mentioned Madeleine Slade or Mira Ben in particular because one of the interesting things, which is a subject in itself, is the fact that throughout this freedom struggle, 
Gandhi never lacked English friends. He never lacked English friends. They were, in other words, there were English men and English women who realized that what Gandhi was achieving to do was to in fact throw the British out of India and they supported him in this enterprise. Right? So, it, so he was always seen by this large group of Englishmen and English women who were, who were friendly to him and Meera Ben is obviously the greatest example of that because she's not simply friendly to him, she becomes more or less his principal assistant in a way. Not his secretary, he had a, he had a secretary, right? Okay? Uh, and that's Mahadev Desai, again a very complicated and extraordinarily interesting relationship between Gandhi and Mahadev Bai, but, but I'm speaking about someone who was by his bedside all the time who was by, besides him, who was his companion if he needed medicines, you know, who attended to his daily needs, who ensured that everything ran smoothly, right? That is Meera Ben. It's not Kasturba who fills that particular role, right? But as I said, what Meera Ben is able to do is something that Kasturba evidently was not able to do. And that partly had to do with, with the fact that um, she was able to mediate between Gandhi and the British in various ways. Yes? Uh, so, um, so she was a daughter of an English admiral. That's right. Well, how did her father view this? Oh, they, oh well, they, they of course thought that this was an act of lunacy on our part, you know. Right? I mean, you know, especially initially when, when as I said, you know, literally, she, she, you read Spirit's Pilgrimage, she tells you the furniture was thrown out. All these expensive French cabinets and this and that. She said, I want the room stripped bare. I am going to practice sleeping on the floor for one year, just as Gandhi has asked me to do before I go to India. So, of course, yeah, that, that's, you know, how, you see, in each of these cases, your question is an important one. But, but we, would need, we would need four courses to address all of these questions in detail. For example, how did all the people who gravitated towards Gandhi, right, what did their families think? What did the families of Kamala Devi and Sarojini and I do think. Right? Who are Kamala Devi? So this allows me to segue into that. Kamala Devi and Sarojini and I do, these are two very prominent Indian women in the 20th century. In fact, I've just completed a book on Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. Okay, a major figure of the 20th century in many, many ways. And not simply because she is a close associate of Gandhi, but, but she is a gigantic figure in her own right. Right? Now, these women all came from families where they testify that one of the things that Gandhi enabled in India was he made it possible for women who came from sheltered backgrounds to come into the public sphere. And again, I want to remind you that even in the West, not that the West should be the yardstick for everything, you know, it's this idea that the West is necessarily progressive on every count is something that we would have to radically critique, that Gandhi does that all the time. But since that's the yardstick that everyone in this room would ordinarily have, where most people in the US would have, is okay, what about the West? I'm saying even by the yardstick of the West, it was uncommon for women to be really coming out in the public sphere. You know, you have to read the literature, a woman merely wearing trousers in 1900 could excite a lot of attention. All right? This is what we're really talking about. And so there's this, there's, this, there's this whole question about what is the role of women in the public sphere. And for those of you who have done American history, you would know, if I can give you an, an interesting account where, a very short one, but I think it would illustrate to you the complexity of the problem, that what is the period in the 20th century when women first come out in the US in a big way in the public sphere. It's World War II. It's World War II because the men were away at the front in huge numbers. World War I is different because the US enters a war very late, 1917. The war is almost over. Right? And of course World War II is on a much larger scale. So you have large number of women who in fact are working in ammunitions industries for example. And you know what happened? The minute the war was over, all of these women were returned to domesticity. There's a huge literature on this. Because the idea was that, well, women did what they had to do, they played the role, now their proper place is back in the home and in the kitchen. This is the United States, 1945. 
that I'm talking about. Right? Now I'm talking about Gandhi in the 1920s. Okay, um, just give me a second because I do need, I do need that uh, the the PowerPoint just for your benefit. So let me quickly plug this in. Uh, let's see. Okay. Okay, so I'm saying to you that 19, uh, just give me a second, 1920s, if you look at Kamla Devi and Sarojini Naidu, they're related, by the way, okay? Um, they come from different families, so Kamla Devi is a sister-in-law of, uh, of Sarojini Naidu. Uh, and Kamla Devi herself comes from a uh, well-to-do family. Uh, she's, she's written an autobiography. The autobiography is called Inner Recesses, Outer Spaces, um, where she basically details her life uh, in, uh, you know, uh, th uh, through most of the 20th century, through most of the 20th century, uh, because she's born in 1903, dies in 1980, I think it was 1988. Um, and uh, one of the things that Kamla Devi points out, an argument that has been advanced by many women in their autobiographies is precisely the one that I have made to you at this juncture. Namely, that the idea that a woman would actually be going out, marching alongside the men, all right, taking part in the freedom struggle, the picketing of liquor shops, what were the roles that were given to women? So there is this interesting question. You know, were they playing the same role as the men did? Were they going to jail? Yes, they were going to jail. But there were also things that women were doing. So, for example, the picketing of liquor shops was something that women did in particular. And one of the reasons why Gandhi thought that this was something that women should do is because he took the view that, that the consumption of liquor was injurious not just to the person who is imbibing the liquor, but it is even more injurious to women. Because the men tend to squander a greater portion of their earnings on liquor. And so there were these countless number of cases, and I think I mentioned to you in this class, if I recall correctly, that down to the present day in India, even today, the regulation is that the day that you get your salary, in most states, the liquor shops are closed that day, because they're, they're worried that many, many of the men will simply go straight with their salary to the liquor shop and then squander half of that salary before they go back home later in the evening, right? So the picketing of liquor shops, and when I say picketing, I mean precisely that. The women would come out in front of the liquor shop, and if a man was trying to go into the liquor shop, now you're using nonviolent strategies, so you don't, you don't carry a, you know, a stick with you and say, well, I'm going to beat you to a pulp, but you simply try to exercise moral coercion on these men not to go into the liquor shop. That's the picketing of liquor shops. So there are various, various things that are associated with the non-cooperation movement and with civil disobedience moving into the 1930s, and all of these women have, as I said, testified in very large numbers that they came from families where this idea that they would actually be going out into the street was really completely unthinkable. Right. Yes? So, so last time you mentioned that Gandhi kept women from the, from his, uh, the South Sharia. Yes. Did you know? From the South Satyagra, yes. But that was the, but that was the, that was the that was only the the movement that Gandhi himself initiated the march himself that is the that is the people that he handpicked did not include women but remember what I mentioned to you and and in fact the the clips that we saw that over the days people started gathering into this movement and so when when Gandhi finally arrives. Uh, at Dandi, what does he find? He finds that there are tens of thousands of people, including women. And in fact, that raid at that salt works, which you saw, it was actually led by a woman. It was led by a woman. Right? So there are particular reasons why women were, and this is why, again, I'm giving the illustration of the liquor shops, that there are particular, there are particular roles that were assigned to women, but there are also arenas of life where they obviously partake in equal measure as the men. Okay? What, but you, see, you have to look at the general picture. The general picture is the idea that a woman would be secluded is something that Gandhi 
did not accept at all. All right? And so what we're really talking about is what is their role in the public domain as a whole? All right? That's what we're really speaking about, you know, as a whole. All right, so, so this Kamla Devi and Ch- Kamla Devi and Ch- Sarojini Naidu, they both rise to very high positions, by the way. Kamla Devi is going to be the president of the Congress Socialist Party in 1926. You know, and Sarojini Naidu, uh, after independence, is going to become the, the governor of one of India's largest states. Right? So both of these women are illustrations of women who essentially l- became closely associated with the movement and I, I, I don't have the luxury here of being able to, you know, I've done that in the book that, that I've just completed with a colleague of mine on Kamla Devi, where we have a huge section on Kamla Devi and Gandhi and what did she talk about, but she wrote a very long article which is called, What Gandhiji Has Done for Indian Women. And this is where she gives you a full-blown account of the fact that, you know, he had insights into women which she says that she as a woman herself did not have into her sisters, so to speak. This is, this is what we are really talking about here. And then finally, as a last illustration, because what I'm really interested in is not so much each and every case, because we could go over a hundred such cases now. Right? But as a, as a final illustration, I want to look at Manu and Abba, and this gives me an opportunity to bring in my own piece and what is undoubtedly probably the most controversial episode, if we want to call that, in Gandhi's life. I mean, I remember when I was growing up and one of the criticisms that my mother and my aunts had was precisely this episode that I have discussed in the long article, which you should certainly read. What am I referring to over here? Okay. Before I get into the details, 1940s, 1940s, Manu and Abba are his grandnieces. Manu is not married. Abba is married. And I'm talking about young women, girls, if you want to put it this way, who are 15, 16 years old. That's what I'm talking about. Okay. In the 1940s, 1942 is what is called the Quit India Movement. So this is the last big push by Gandhi and the Indian Congress Party to get the British to leave India. The title of the movement says a lot. Quit India, right? We just want you to leave India now. Because by this point, a, a problem is, has arisen, which we are going to address in much greater detail later on. And that problem is the rift, the divide between the Hindus and the Muslims. By the 1930s, this has now become a political problem. And it's going to escalate this tension to the point where Muslims or some Muslims are going to suggest that if the British are going to leave India, they are not prepared to stay in a Hindu dominated India. That they want a separate nation state for themselves, right? Which eventually, of course, is going to be created in 1947. That separate nation state is Pakistan, of course, right? We'll, we'll transition to that story later on. Important thing is, 1942, it's quit India. The British is saying, well, we, one of the reasons we can't leave India is if we leave India, it's going to be chaotic. Because you Hindus and Muslims are just going to completely slaughter each other. Nothing's going to be left. Right? So this is, again, the colonial argument that we are transcendent. You know, we are above all of these. Everybody trusts us, but you don't trust each other. I'm giving it to you in a quick capsule form. 1944, Gandhi, and one of the consequences of the quit India movement was the entire top leadership of the Congress party, except a few who were able to go into hiding very quickly. The entire top leadership of the Congress party is going to be put in jail. And one of the reasons for that is not simply because Gandhi had issued the call, quit India. Gandhi and the Congress took the decision that they were not going to support the British in the war. Remember, World War II is going on at this juncture. It started in 1939, and the Congress adopted a position of neutrality, which infuriated the British, particularly Churchill. And why did the Congress adopt the position of neutrality? Because the Congress view was, frankly, there's no reason why we should privilege the imperialists over the fascists. They're equally oppressors. 
Yes, we understand that, you know, you've got the fascists in Germany and in Italy, right? But why, why should we as Indians, as oppressed people, take the view that these fascists are necessarily a greater menace to our liberty than the imperialist, than the British and the French? After all, the British have been dominating us for 200 years. So the Congress took the view of neutrality, and it was only in 1944 when Germany is going to be pretty much out of the war, so to speak, that the British government of India is going to release okay, Gandhi and the other Congress leaders. Kasturba has died, by the way, in the meantime, in custody. Now, when Gandhi is released, 19, we're talking about 1944, and we're moving into the 19, you know, late 1940s, mid-1940s, the writing is on the wall, meaning that the British have now come around to the view that they will not be able to hold on to India for very long. That's what I mean when I say the writing is on the wall. That independence is on the horizon. The question is, what kind of independence would India have? Would, would it be one state or would it be two states or several states? We don't need to move into the complexities of those negotiations at this juncture. What I'm trying to do is place the backdrop to introduce Manu and Abba as well. Before I move into a discussion of this experiment that he undertakes towards the end of his life. All right. So moving into 1944, 45, 46, what we're going to find is an escalation of communal violence between Hindus and Muslims. And in a place in eastern India, that place is now in Bangladesh. It is no longer in India because after the partition. So this is a place, it's called Noakhali. Okay, in what was eastern Bengal, now Bangladesh. In a place called Noakhali, there had been these massive killings. Okay, communal killings as they're called. Communal here is this particular Indian usage where we're referring to religious communities as they are construed, right? And the differences between the two which now are boiling over into violence. Now Gandhi's view was that this upsurge of communal violence, and you can say was, he had a fantastic ego or an abominable ego to think that way. You could take that view. And if you took that view, Try to defend it, right? Because it is a plausible view from the point of view of his critics. Gandhi's, what was Gandhi's take on this? Gandhi's take was this ref violence outside is a reflection of my failures. It is because I have not been principled in my observance of nonviolence that that has something to do with the violence too. And this is what I mean by this monumental ego to suppose that, well, because of the turmoil within myself or because I have not adhered to the strictest standards of nonviolence, therefore this violence is taking place. Of course, it's not really a causal relationship in that sense. But what Gandhi is saying is that this violence that is taking place is a reflection of my shortcomings. Okay? Now, what, do, what does he mean when he says shortcomings? It's not simply the fact that he has not been observant enough in the exercise or practice of nonviolence. He also meant by that that he had not been able to conquer his sexual urge. Right? That even though he had taken this vow of celibacy, right, he had not been able to fully conquer this sexual urge. And I have to tell you, this, this is a view that, that is not a view that has uh, got many people who are willing to accept it, if any. Uh, there, is a, there is a strand of very radical feminists who actually would agree with Gandhi. Gandhi actually was of the view that the act of sexual intercourse itself is a form of violence by men on women. Right? So, you know, if you want to sort of take a radical feminist view, you would have to look at, let's say, the works of somebody like Andrea Dorkin. I'm giving you two names of feminists that, whose work you can look at because there is a strand of radical feminism which actually takes that view. 
It's not that the act is intrinsically violent, because somebody might say, oh, two people are, might be deeply in love with each other. How can you call that violence? And, and, and Gandhi is not remotely interested in, in contesting that per se. He's saying that the nature of sexual intercourse in a society such as ours is already implicated in the act of violence because of the massive inequality between men and women. That a woman might think she is giving her consent, but there are systemic considerations which actually impinge upon how we understand the act of sexual intercourse. All right. So, you know, Andrea Dworkin, Catherine McKinnon would be the other major radical American feminist who has articulated a view something like that. Now, what does Gandhi do? He undertakes an experiment, a yajna. A great yajna is a great sacrifice, as it were. He invites Manu, Abba, and his personal physician. And let me hasten to add, not at the same time. It's not like three women are jumping into the bed together with him. Okay, right? But there are a number of women who are involved in this experiment. And what does the experiment entail? It entails that Gandhi invites Manu and Abba and Shushila Nair, that's his personal physician. His personal physician was a woman. To sleep with him naked. Okay, and this is what I, as, as I said to you, this is extremely controversial. There are people who, uh, yeah, as I pointed out to you, my mother would always say to me, yeah, you know, Bapu was a great man, but they had this one failing. Yeah, why did he have to do this? You know, I, I, I can't tell you, all of my aunts were uniformly of that view, of course. You know, why did he have to do this? Right? Now, my purpose here is not to defend this or to... On the other hand, express, you know, outrage, which is immediately. Let me also say to you that both Manu and Abba and Shushila as well, all of them outlived Gandhi, of course. Manu and Abba were in, were in their late teens. And they've been interviewed about this. And one of the things that Manu said is so striking that immediately if you think about what she's saying, it alerts you to the fact that we need a very different interpretive framework to understand this, right? What does she say? She says, I thought nothing of this at all. She says, within three minutes of me getting into bed with Bapu, because he was always addressed as Bapu, the father, she says, I was sound asleep. And what does she do? She writes a book. And you know what that book is called? It's called Bapu, My Mother. Bapu, My Mother. Now this is why I think we need an entirely different interpretive framework. See, by the way, in, in Indian families, even to the present day, it's very common that particularly households which are cramped, which are millions and hundreds of millions of them because, uh, you know, of the difficult living conditions under which most Indians live, that, you know, you, there are eight people live, sleeping in one room. Mothers and daughters are sleeping next to each other on the same bed constantly, even when the daughters are grown up, you know. Okay, very, very common. Nothing unusual even remotely about that. Now the fact that she thought of Gandhi as her mother tells you a lot about the whole politics of femininity and masculinity. You see, the conventional view would be, you know, if you were living in the US today, and let's say you were, you know, a moderate on the question of political correctness, not an extreme extremist. Extremist, then everybody would need a debriefing on everything, on race, sex, because everybody's a sexist or racist pig or this or that, right? If you take the extreme kind of political correctness view. But let's take a moderate view. The moderate view would be that, that the first thing that is important in, in a relationship between a man or a woman, or a man and a man and a woman and a woman, whatever the nature of the relationship, is something called consent. It should be consensual, right? That's that's the liberal, moderate view. And I think here, by the way, we have a problem. We have a problem because you could say, well, 
Did Gandhi really ask Manu as such, right? And did she give her consent as such? I mean, did she sign a form? You know the California law now, right? At every step you're supposed to on this campus, by the way, right? Before you can kiss a person, you're supposed to ask them, is it okay if I give you a kiss? And they're supposed to give you their consent. That's a law, by the way. I don't know if you know that. Yes, I'm not joking. Before every step of the way, okay? Yeah, right? It's, a, it's the yes, yes law, right? Now, did Gandhi give his, did Manu give his consent? That's one way to look at it. I'm not really particularly interested in that because you could give a critique of that. What would be the critique? What would it mean for Manu to give her consent? After all, the person who's asking her is not some bloke from the street who's 20 years old. It's the Mahatma. How do you turn down the Mahatma? If the Mahatma says to, to Manu, Manu, I have this problem that I think that I have not conquered my sexual urge and, and this is deeply agitating me. Why is it deeply agitating me? Because it shows that I have not mastered nonviolence. Remember that the sexual urge is the urge to violence for him too. Right? So I don't think that that would be the litmus test. Because if it were the litmus test, you would say that if there's a problem there. The problem is that it's a vastly unequal relationship between the two. On the other hand, it is interesting that he didn't just pick any of the 5,000 women randomly that he knew. There were thousands of women that he knew. You know, people who would come and ask him for advice. He goes to someone who is very close to him. We have to understand that. Because his expectation was that Manu, having grown up in the ashram with him, and that is what happened. Manu grew up in the ashram with him. So when you read Bapu, my mother, there are such touching stories there. Because he literally took care of her as an Indian woman would take care of her daughter. You know that when she needed her long hair combed, he would oil it. She tells you about it. Then he would comb it. And he's talking with a political leader about independence at the same time. Right? Every single attentive detail. You know, she needs a medicine, he goes and gets it, right? He was looking out for her. Not just that, his expectation was, she understands me. She understands perhaps what this experiment is about, you know? And of course, you know, there were all these cynics and critics, and some of that you have to sort of, you know, take in your stride because... Once Gandhi was asked, you know, by somebody, I think, the, and this is, he understood how radical this was, that this would not go down well with the Indian audience at all. It's the only occasion in his life where initially he was not forthright. In other words, nobody was told about the experiment, ex except the people in the ashram knew about it, but he hadn't made it public. And then one of the secretaries who were working for him resigned because he was disturbed by this, and then Gandhi makes it known to the public. But initially it was not known to the public. Right? Initially it was not known to the public. And so, you know, when he was asked at that, initially when it was made known to the public, why have you undertaken this? He tried to explain, but he realized that he had run up against a wall because everybody said, well, this sounds absurd, you know, right? And the Gandhi said, well, I'm just doing this in order to keep myself warm. And then, you know, what, the, what of course, the quip was, well, why don't you just get yourself three more blankets? You know, right? If you want to keep yourself warm, just get three more blankets. Right? But, of course, it had nothing to do with blankets and keeping yourself warm. It had to do, and, and Gandhi then articulates this at great length in subsequent documents and letters and speeches and so forth. And there was a rift. A number of the people who were very close to him left. Now, I am not going to give you a full-blown account of how to interpret this, because that's what my article does. And that article was assigned to you, so you read that article and you begin to sense for yourself exactly what it is that Gandhi is attempting to do, right? But again, I want to just reiterate w one thing on when we are, while we're on this point, namely that there was never any suggestion, not even by his critics, that there was actually any sexual intercourse or sexual acts between the two. It was that he would, he would be in bed and she would come into bed, Manu or Abba or whoever it is, um, and that was the end of the matter. 
All right. Now, I want to take a few more minutes um, to move into this because I haven't been able to, to conclude my discussion here. So we're going to spend about 15, 20 minutes on this uh, in the following lecture. Um, uh, what I want to do is I want to, because remember what I had said to you, that there is a critique of masculinity that Gandhi has. Okay? And I've hinted at it now. I've hinted at it when I suggest, for example, that Manu writes this little book called Bapu, My Mother. Right? That she sees him as an embodiment of femininity. Um, and I think there's no question that one of the things that Gandhi was attempting to do throughout his adult life was to feminize the public sphere. To feminize the public sphere. There is a shade of that in American political discourse or British political discourse, but a very small shade. I mean, barely there. In the suggestion that you sometimes get that if someone like Hillary Clinton were to become, for example, President of the United States, right? That that might make things a little softer, you know? I think that's completely erroneous because she's a complete hawk, by the way. She's going to be more men than any of the men around, for sure. Even more than Donald Trump. That's my own view, that she's, she's hawkish to the extreme. Okay? And, you know, we have seen instances where women have been prime ministers. Britain is a good example. Three countries that I know actually very well. Britain, Israel, and India. All three have had women prime ministers, and all three were extremely hawkish. Extremely hawkish. Okay. So I don't think that the feminization of the public sphere occurs simply when women come into power. No. Because if they are playing the game of real politik, they are playing by the established rules. What Gandhi was attempting to do was to in fact change the established rules altogether. And one way to understand his life, which is a separate lecture, really is to look at his whole political endeavor as a critique of what I'm calling normal politics. The normalization of certain ways of doing politics, such as what electoral democracies do. Right? So in order to understand that, what we would have to do is we would have to look very broadly, which I'm going to begin with, just giving you a little idea so that you can start thinking beforehand a little bit about what are the ways in which he may have tried to feminize the public sphere. Okay. What are his pronouncements on women like? And how do they square up with what he actually did? Because one of the things I want to suggest straight away and for you to think about is that when you actually look at what Gandhi writes about women, and that's why you have those selections from that book called Gandhi and Women, you find that what he writes about women often, not always, is very conventional. Very conventional. But Madhu Kishor made the argument that what is radically different about Gandhi is that unlike politicians who will say the most progressive things, but will do the most conservative things, Gandhi was the other way around. That he's made these pronouncements and said, oh, this is what women do, this is what men do. These are the spheres of life for men and women. Because he understood that he had to speak to certain constituencies where the idea that women would step out into the public sphere or that women would, would do things which were considered to be beyond what was the expectation, this would be radical. And what Madhu Keshwar argues is that actually it's not his pronouncements, it's what he did. That, for example, the extent to which he allowed women to come into the public sphere, to come into his life, to shape the political discourse of an emerging India, that this gives you a very different picture. That, that in his ashram, the men and the women spent an equal amount of time in the kitchen. Because, of course, the model for women everywhere in the world was this model of domesticity. Right? And so... We're going to have to see what are the ways in which Gandhi is going to modulate some of this. And then from there we're going to move to this. So I'll get back to both of these slides in my, in my subsequent lecture. But the politics of sexuality, his critique of masculinity. What was his critique of masculinity? What did he understand by it? And why does he elevate femininity? And what are the consequences of that? All right, so we will begin with that. 
um, at my next lecture.